sleek and they go fast and they make lots of noise and everybody is wowed by them. They're deceptively beautiful. It's like Venus flytraps. Aircraft launched from the sea, from carriers. Air-to-air -air missiles, air-to-ground missiles, GPS-guided bombs. One of those frontline Hornets has everything you could need to, to really just go out there and, and wreak havoc. These aircraft have left their mark on America's history in ways that few of us know. They had no right to win, but they did. And in doing so, they changed the course of a war. I lost 22% of the guys in my squadron. 22%, you never forget that. This film follows young pilots today as they learn their craft and tells the sweeping history that they are heirs to. I watched every World War movie I could get my hands on as a little kid. The history was one of the things that really drew me to this life. These were people who were willing to literally bet their lives to go ahead and bring this technology and this new kind of warfare to the forefront. Back in the early 20th century, this is somewhat psychotic. You are a part of a lineage of people that have been witness to the biggest events of the 20th and now 21st century. You feel that every day you're a part of something bigger. But embedded in this lineage is also controversy. Again and again, over its hundred years, this craft has been called into question as impractical, extravagant, obsolete. Now, today, a new round of doubts and reason to wonder if this generation of aviators just might be America's last. This is the story of a weapon that changed the face of war. We did our cross country to, uh, to Vegas. She's a good instructor. I started racing dirt bikes, actually. I kind of want to be a professional dirt bike racer and then quit the racing, went to college, and decided to come in the Marine Corps. And best decision ever made. Yeah. Should be pretty cool. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Cool. Y'all following him out? Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> My mom used to take us uh, to an airport nearby where we grew up, and you could sit out close to the flight line and see people taking off and landing and stuff, and saw planes flying over. Uh, like this guy. It kind of captivates a young mind, I think, and it definitely grabs me early on. I tell a student, you know, hey, what am I gonna teach you how to do here? I want you to learn how to taxi, take off, go out and do something, and you're gonna come back and land. And you're gonna do that on land, and you're gonna do that on a ship. Every little thing will affect your psyche before you're going out to the boat. You're going over the entire flight 500 times in your head long before you even get there. You can imagine the, the instruments and how they're changing. 
in your head you can imagine the airplane accelerating faster. We're gonna fly out there. First time you see the carrier that you're going to, it'll be about 15 miles out, and you realize you're gonna be landing on there, stopping on what looks to be about a little drop of oil in the sea. I think universally, the first time you roll up behind the boat, uh, oh crap, is what comes to people's minds. Uh, everybody says it looks like a postage stamp. Uh, the first time you go overhead, uh, you look down and think, well, there's no way. They, they made a bad mistake. Part of the, the mental preparation is, is trying to think, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see it. It's going to look different than what I imagined. Uh, it's going to feel different than the simulator. I'm going to freak out, and I'm going to keep flying. In the early 20th century, Americans flocked to air meets to witness with their own eyes a man take to the sky. In an age of innovation, nothing seemed more wondrous than the airplane. These air meets would draw people from all walks of life. It was real popular because here they have these aircraft flying, buzzing around. Well, oftentimes there were accidents which were almost as appealing as the uh, flying itself. The Army and Navy, too, were intrigued and sent their representatives to the very first air meets. The Army instantly saw the potential of flight and began purchasing airplanes. The Navy, though, was at a loss. The idea of using a flying machine on the open sea was beyond almost everyone's imagination. Everyone except a middle-aged naval officer convinced that planes and ships working together could become a powerful new weapon. Captain Washington Irving Chambers is sort of an unlikely champion of aviation. He's a product of the 19th century um, traditional naval warfare. Um, he graduated from the Naval Academy not too far removed from the Civil War. But Chambers really expressed an interest in aviation. He wanted to look into it and study it. That's why he traveled to some of the air meets that were happening. He would go there to see what the latest technology in aviation was. In the fall of 1910, Chambers attended an air show in Belmont Park, New York, in search of a pilot willing to try a grand experiment, launching an aircraft from a ship. Among the daredevils and showmen at the meet, one man clearly stood out, Eugene Ely. Most people think early aviation. They think of aviators in these you know, leather jackets and flowing scarves and everything. And Ely, he just doesn't look the part of the dashing aviator. If you look at the pictures of him performing these feats, he was wearing a standard business suit. He had a bicycle inner tube wrapped around him for flotation. He wore a primitive football helmet. He's from Iowa as far away from the ocean as you can possibly imagine, and someone who really didn't really care for the water and didn't really like swimming. But when Chambers proposed the idea, Ely, the man who didn't like water, couldn't resist. In addition to being a pretty good pilot, Ely also had a surprising eye as an engineer. He gets the idea that he can build a wooden flight deck on a warship, like a cruiser or a battleship, and actually get it going fast enough that if he flies his airplane off the end of it, he can actually get it into the air and safely maneuver it. Well, back in the early 20th century, this is somewhat psychotic. Soon after their meeting, Chambers outfitted the cruiser, the USS Birmingham, with a makeshift wooden deck Built to Ely's specifications, the platform was only 83 feet long and 24 feet wide. On the morning of November 14, 1910, rain squalls filled the sky. Ely waited nervously.
Finally, at three o'clock in the afternoon, the weather cleared. So Ely climbed aboard and revved up the engine as much as it would go. And as he went over the edge of the deck and out over the water, he actually descended a little bit quicker than he thought. He thought he might crash, and the wheels actually grazed the water as he took off from Birmingham. But um, picked up enough flying speed that the wind went beneath the wings, developed some lift, and he was able to take off and fly to shore. Chambers was pleased, but he knew the hardest part was yet to come landing a speeding airplane on a rolling ship. Again, Chambers relied on Ely's practical know-how. Ely was facing the prospect of flying into the back of the smokestacks of the ship, so he had to come up with some way of stopping the airplane. So what they did is they had sandbags connected by ropes, and these ropes were strung across the wooden deck at a series of intervals and there were a series of hooks beneath the aircraft. And as these hooks snagged on those ropes, the weight of the sandbags there would bring the plane to a stop as it hit the deck. The weather on January 18th, 1911 was cold. Ely flew from an air meet to the USS Pennsylvania, 10 miles offshore. Eugene Ely made his approach to Cruiser Pennsylvania and successfully got into what is now referred to as the proper glide slope. Hit the deck, and the ropes caught the hooks on the bottom of his aircraft and eventually brought the plane to a stop. And it was just a, a, an amazing event. No one had ever seen anything like this before. I mean, you have to think at that time, you're only about seven years removed, eight years removed from the Wright brothers' flights. And here you have sailors seeing an aircraft land aboard their ship. It was something that was you know, really, one, observing it must have been an experience to remember. And the amazing thing is, the metaphors laid out by Ely of the flight deck, of the arresting gear, of the tail hook, are things that we still use a hundred years later. The man was a visionary. But Eugene Ely would not live to see the magnitude of what he'd achieved. Within months, he was killed in a plane crash during an air meet. My father was a A6 intruder guy. So as a young one, I got taken to lots and lots of air shows. I'd climb up on my dad's shoulders. Any kid is gonna look up and think it's grand and amazing and they wanna do it. And remember what I told you about the Roland is that when you, when you see that, that uh, line down there. The thought of landing on the carrier is still a very big idea and not ominous, but it's still a heavy thought, landing on a giant chunk of metal in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, yeah second to last flight for uh, head off to the boat on Monday, so. Two more chances to perfect it before we go, <laughs> or, or bracket the, the mistakes. When you're preparing to go to the carrier, all the students will grow a mustache. It's kind of maybe a little bit of a badge of courage around the squadron that you're far enough in the program that they're going to let you go to the boat. Some of the fine young gentlemen going out to the boat are not quite as uh, <sighs> gifted in the mustache growing department, I guess. Um, some of them look exceptionally creepy. I'm not a mustache guy, but 
and it doesn't help that my mustache is blonde, so uh, it's not coming in too great, but. Unless you are a very special girl, you are not going to grow a mustache. But I have every intent of either finding like some like stick on mustache or I'm just gonna draw it on every day because you know, you gotta, you gotta run with the guys. Oh, have you seen the one with the Russian guy? I mean, when I'm at work, I'm one of the dudes. <laughs> when I get home, it's hair down, skirts, dresses. I like being a girl. And I've found myself to end up being more feminine now than I used to be because it's almost like recharging the estrogen levels when I get home. It's definitely a competition. Everybody wants to be the best. You know, it doesn't matter if there are Army guys here or, or Air Force guys here. It, it's the same thing. Everybody just wants to be the best. With that being said, I mean, Navy guys are my good friends, too. There's always a, a little bit of a rivalry between the Navy and the Marines. Jordan and I are pretty good friends. We've gone through all of flight school in Kingsville together. We classed up back 14 months ago and pretty much been flying together. Yeah, me, me and Rob, we started ground school day one in this building together and went through everything pretty much together. That looks good. Uh, probably a little Anytime I was having issues, I would go talk to Rob and Rob would get me straightened out, so. And, uh, we can keep working at Joker, but at Bingo, no kidding, it's time to knock it off and, and point toward home. We're creating a tactical jet naval aviator Certainly most of the aviators coming through our program are likely to see combat, and yes, they'll be ready. For more than a decade after Eugene Ely's pioneering flights, U.S. naval aviation stood still. Most people would think that, hey, this is a triumphant event. This is a, a major demonstration. The Navy is going to fall over itself to buy aircraft. Well, that wasn't the case. Airplanes were still made of wood and fabric and could barely hold the weight of a man, much less a heavy bomb. But from the moment he witnessed Ely's plane land on a ship, Captain Washington Chambers could imagine the future. Chambers could look down the pipeline and see that there were tantalizing new technologies beginning to appear on the horizon. New materials like aluminum, new structures like monocoques, new fuels like high octane gasoline. Planes were going to get faster, they were going to go farther, they could lift more. They were also going to be more deadly and more maneuverable. By the end of World War I, the airplane had become a part of modern warfare. The British were the leaders, but the Americans were anxious to catch up. So were the Japanese, who built the world's first aircraft carrier from the ground up. The Navy embraced seaplanes for reconnaissance, but the effort involved in lowering and retrieving the planes made them useless for much else. For Chambers, it was clear the Navy was falling behind. He continued to press. You have Chambers going and doing this incredible marketing job to a very conservative general board of the US Navy, trying to sell a very new, very expensive technology which, oh, by the way, required the building of some of the largest and most powerful warships in the world to prove that it was even viable. For the Navy brass, carrier aviation was a distant fantasy. Nothing could replace the king of their fleet, the battleship. Up to this point, the war plans of every nation in the world still envisioned big gun battleships 
8, 10, 12 at a time, lobbing one-ton shells at each other until one side or the other gave up, and that would determine the fate of nations. The final push towards carrier aviation came unexpectedly, not from inside the Navy, but from an inter-service rivalry fueled by a brash Army general named Billy Mitchell. Mitchell had been in charge of all America's airplanes in World War I, an experience that forever changed his vision of war. If you look at World War I, it was just a horrific experience. You had trench warfare. People killed by the thousands and hundreds of thousands. And you had people like General Billy Mitchell who looked upon the airplane as a way that could change warfare and would, could get warfare out of the trenches. Mitchell's determination matched his arrogance. He wanted to consolidate all military air power under one service, an independent air force under his command. Mitchell set out to do something big, something never done before. If the whole world believed that airplanes could not kill ships, well, then he would prove them wrong. In July of 1921, he orchestrated a show for decision makers in Congress. Mitchell's airplanes first destroyed several old battlecruisers. Then came the most important test. Each plane carried a newly invented 2,000-pound bomb. Their target, a captured German battleship, long deemed unsinkable. This was a triumph for Billy Mitchell, and it achieved the exact opposite of what he wanted. It triggered in Navy leadership a decision to look at, hey, we have this air power advocate, General Billy Mitchell, and if we don't embrace aviation and look at aviation as an adjunct to the fleet, then we may have an independent air force on our hands and also may have a Navy that's greatly diminished. Within a few months, the Navy regained the lead, converting a cargo ship into an aircraft carrier christened the Langley. The age of American carrier aviation was born. The Langley operated for two years in an experimental role, testing aircraft and training pilots. like to talk about the golden age of naval aviation in the 20s, where we had wooden airplanes and iron men. These were people who were willing to literally bet their lives to go ahead and bring this technology and this new kind of warfare to the forefront. It was hard, and it was dangerous, and a lot of naval aviators died. And this is really where the reputation of naval aviation began to be built. The naval aviators of the interwar period are very much characters out of the movies. Yeah, they had silk scarves. Yeah, they had leather jackets and flying helmets. Yeah, they had steely-eyed looks, and they were handsome, and they did daring deeds. They were, for lack of a better term, the macho men of their time, the uh, guys that had uh, no fear. Just as they were confident in their own capabilities, uh, set apart from those that preferred to keep their two feet on the ground. I guess the word is probably ego. Probably ego. It was probably what got me into it. I, man, I want to, you know, I want to be a big shot. 
The image of a naval aviator was a red convertible, top down, with a beautiful blonde alongside. Who could want anything else? Every day you're operating in three dimensions. You don't have time to, to, we call it breaking out the book and read and see what the problem is and fix it. You just don't have time to do that. So if you don't have things memorized cold, uh, you can't put them into action quick enough. We make our own mistakes and tell the plane to do the wrong thing sometimes. If things go wrong, they can go really wrong. <laughs> Some days you're you're just on. Some days you're not. Hopefully we'll we'll peak uh, when we head to the boat and and have a good day. We're practiced. We're you know well rested. We're ready to go and we're at the the top part of the game, you know, close to being as as good as we can be. They're going to move it in uh, 500 pound increments when you give them the signals. So palm up like that. And then the palm down, horizontal, is move it down. I'm having a, a feeling that I'm going to look and be like, wow, I have to land in that little, that little spot. And you know, that boat's not as big as I thought it was going to be. But trying to keep those out of the head right now and just focus on what, what we were taught to do. This will be a completely new experience for me and most all the other students. We have no fleet experience. It's going to be loud. It's going to be busy. I mean, they, they've been showing us all week of people killing themselves behind the boat, you know, crashing left and right. It's all learning points you can take from, and remember, don't do that. I don't want to turn into a fireball. I'd like to land and come home at the end of this. The nerves crank up. It's a, it is uh, completely foreign, and uh, it, it, probably the most exciting thing we've done to, in our lives to this point, so. In the mid-1920s, the Navy had just one small carrier, the Langley. Airplanes had become sturdier, the pilots better trained. But still unresolved was how to use all of this in war. Amid the wavering, one figure emerged to take the lead. His name was Admiral Joseph Mason Reeves. Every move of these naval aircraft has a definite purpose and has the single aim of achieving a fighting fleet. His nickname was Billy Goat Reeves because he had this beard and goatee that he wore. He's a hard charger, a football player at the Naval Academy, studied tactics, and he is a convert to naval aviation. Reeves chafed at naval doctrine that confined planes to reconnaissance. He was after a weapon as lethal as the battleship. For him, it very quickly became, how can we use this aircraft carrier not as a support weapon, but as an offensive weapon, as the offensive centerpiece of, of a naval force? Admiral Reeves understood, even with Langley, that you had to maximize the number of planes that could be launched from that flight deck. Bringing the most intense concentration of firepower onto a target as possible. In 1928, Reeves got a platform that matched his ambitions. The United States takes two incredible hulls of battle cruisers they were building, and they put all of their tonnage into these two ships, and they produced two of the most beautiful, powerful, and in fact, the fastest warships in the world, the Lexington and the Saratoga. Reeves loaded the two carriers with nearly 100 planes each. And within a year, he overcame the seemingly impossible. 
launching and landing dozens of airplanes in rapid fire succession. It's a jigsaw puzzle. It's like baseball, it's a game of inches. You can pick a million different cliches, and, and I don't think any of them really accurately capture what happens on a flight deck with dozens of airplanes, some launching, some recovering. There was this constant ballet going on, choreographed by the deck department, the air department, literally hundreds of young men using their bare hands and muscles to push 90 or 100 airplanes. New and better planes were in the pipeline. The Curtis SBC-4 Helldiver could carry a 1,000-pound bomb almost 600 miles. The next challenge, delivering the bombs with more precision. And for that, they invented dive bombing. Dive bombing is a technique that was developed by the Navy because it provided a very accurate way of bombing a pinpoint target. And ships are pinpoint targets. The planes come in at about 10,000 feet and then pushes over into a steep dive. And when I say steep, meaning going straight down. Inside of the cockpit, they often flew with their canopies open. As the airplane would push over, the visceral feeling of being lifted out of your seat and hanging from your straps, looking through a very simple reflectored gun sight. Meanwhile, this ship that you're aiming at, well, it's a moving target. It's snaking, it's circling, it's changing its speed. Then at about 2,800 to about 1,500 feet, which isn't very high at all, you would release the bomb. And then immediately pull in excess of anywhere from four to six or seven Gs uh, to come out of that dive. Naval aviation had gained power reach, numbers, and precision, but was still untested in battle. Starting in 1929, the Navy began a series of war games called Fleet Problems that put Reeves's theories to the test. None proved as prophetic as the vast Pacific exercise known as Fleet Problem 13. On February 7, 1932, the carriers Lexington and Saratoga peeled away from the fleet and sailed towards Hawaii. 152 planes were dispatched to attack Pearl Harbor with dummy bombs. In the mock assault, they pounded the airfields and port facilities. And why it's so important is because it showed that the carrier could operate independently and operate as its own task force and did not need to have the battle line there for support. And it showed the offensive firepower of the aircraft carrier. The Navy minimized the risks of an attack by carriers. For the next decade, the old strategy stayed largely unchanged. These are tough times. This is the Depression. We had existing battleships. They were there. They were paid for. They were, we knew exactly how to employ them and they worked. But Fleet Problem 13 did not go unnoticed. Across the Pacific, the Japanese studied it closely. Over the next decade, they would expand their fleet of large carriers to six. They would build the Zero, a state-of-the-art fighter plane. They would train 3,500 naval pilots. The 
the carrier force that moved toward Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 was the largest and most powerful in the world. In a bitter irony, Pearl Harbor would stand as the first real world proof that carrier aviation was the next super weapon. When you walk out on the deck in the mornings, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. It's quiet, it's peaceful. And you start to uh, pre-flight, you can feel the ship starting to wake up. You can hear the surf going underneath the hull. You can look out on the horizon, see the clouds, and you just breathe in that fresh air and you go, it's a good day to fly. out as a division of flight of four and everybody that was qualifying was solo and that's another appeal to to what we do is that you get to go out there alone it's on you everybody says that your reputation it doesn't matter how well you fly in the air your reputation that everybody hears about is how well you land on the carrier and the, the formation part of the flying was really shaky i thought we should have looked better coming overhead the ship uh, just some, and I think that was more nerves than anything, but the, the three students, we definitely, it was, it was pretty ugly coming overhead. To, to see that piece of American territory out there in the middle of the ocean is awesome. It, it, the first time when you're coming over and, and you look down, it's, you kind of get the chills. I don't know if they were nervous chills or, or just, but wow, it makes you very humble. When you get out to the boat, pretty much just spend 10 minutes giving yourself this like, once in a lifetime pep talk. The next thing you know, towers calling you down to get set up for landing. You have an LSO who's standing next to the wires on the deck on the landing area and he's grading all your passes. They're listening uh, for the sounds the engine's making. They can tell uh, you've made a mistake before you see the mistake. Rolled out, the ball was a little high to begin with, and uh, to keep it safe, bumped up the power a little bit. The landing area is angled to the left of the center line of the ship. So anytime you, you roll up behind the ship, the, the landing area is actually moving away from you, not just away from you, but to the right. So you're always lining up a little right. You'll see the plane kind of undulate. Uh, you'll see black smoke shooting out of the exhaust because you're, you're in there fighting. Saw the LSOs go by and they were all staring straight up at me. Saw the wires go by, it's 30 feet over them. I, I knew mid-pass that it was, that I just bought that bolter big time, so it, power back up and take back off. A bolter is when they come around with their hook down and they land too long and they miss all the wires. And they have to go around and try it again. The first trap was kind of a, a rough pass for me. Rolled out, center line. I believe it was a good start to a little high in the middle and trying to chip it down, trying to chip it down to a little high at the ramp. The first trap is, there's no way to really describe how it's going to be. It's this screeching noise.
your body gets thrown forward in your seat. When you get that feeling, it's, it's nice because you know you're in fact stopped and on the boat. First attempt at stopping on the boat, made it. <laughs> they taxi me over to get fuel and you know, you're still shaking, your foot's sitting there pulsing. And you know, they taxi you up to the cat, shoot me off. Everything goes dead silent. My first initial thought was that my engine just failed. I had to realize that I was still climbing and my airspeed was increasing to realize that I'm, I'm safely airborne. Coming down a high start and trying to chip it down while remembering the first pass, which was my fly through down for the one wire. Didn't want to do that. Kept too much power on it. And I forgot to put my hook down. Around I went, so. Second day, the fangs came out a little bit more. I guess the cockiness came out, maybe. Jordan Meredith, one of my good buddies, he had a better second day, but it ended up being, uh, I edged him out just by a little bit. With, with Rob being in the Navy, me being in the Marine Corps, Rob's chances of going back to the boat are almost guaranteed. I mean, that's all the Navy jet pilots go to the boat, whereas Marine jet pilots don't necessarily go to the boat ever again. So we've pretty much been flying together. We've gone out to El Centro to do bombing together, and obviously we went to the carrier together. So it'll be uh, tough. He's a Marine, which means that the odds are I probably won't see him again in my career. I was kind of depressed because the fact that Marines don't always get to go to the boat uh, and the fact that I may never go to the boat again, it's such a cool experience that you don't want it to end, and when it does, it's kind of kind of rough. Devastation at Pearl Harbor was the work of carriers. 350 Japanese planes launched from hundreds of miles out at sea. In just two hours, they wiped out most of the battleships of the Pacific Fleet. It was a master stroke. Japan had not been stopped, and there were some people in the United States who believed Japan couldn't be stopped that eventually Japan would not only control all of China, the Philippines, the Dutch East Indies, but the northern coast of Australia, possibly even India. In the United States, the loss of the battleships upended every plan for how a war in the Pacific could be fought and won. By sheer luck, three aircraft carriers had been spared. They were out at sea during the attack. You have this bizarre situation that the Japanese attack with aircraft carriers forces the United States into a carrier-based naval strategy. It was now up to the US carriers to hold the line against Japan's Imperial Navy. In June of 1942, the Japanese fleet moved toward a pair of small American-held islands in the Pacific. Midway Atoll was just a 1,000 miles west of Hawaii and strategically important. A threat of invasion was sure to draw a full-out American response. It was designed as a perfect trap. The American sortie with about 50 ships. Three of them are aircraft carriers. 
They're facing off against what look to be impossible odds. The enemy has vast, vast numbers of ships, almost 200 ships. They've sorted the entire combined fleet. The morning of June 4th did not start well for the Americans. Radar on Midway began tracking 107 incoming Japanese planes. Within minutes, every operational U.S. plane was in the air. The Japanese bombers swept through the defenses. Out at sea, the U.S. carriers Enterprise, Hornet, and Yorktown launched their planes, hoping to hit the Japanese carriers before they could unleash a second strike. Three squadrons of TBD Devastator torpedo planes reached the Japanese fleet. Flying at wave top level, they were easy prey for anti-aircraft fire. Of 41 torpedo planes, only four survived. Not one torpedo scored. The early strikes that morning, both from Midway and from the American carriers, suffer crippling losses. The casualties were just insane. Of the men and aircraft that launched that morning, about half did not return. Meanwhile, two squadrons of SBD Dauntless dive bombers launched from the Enterprise in search of the Japanese carriers. They were led by a 40-year-old lieutenant commander from Buffalo, New York, named Wade McCluskey. McCluskey gets out to the point where he's been told the Japanese fleet will be waiting for you there. Gets out there, butkus. Nothing in sight. Staring at the vast expanse of ocean, McCluskey had to decide whether to return his men to the Enterprise or lead them on a fool's errand. And McCluskey decides, well, I'm going to take my force of two squadrons of dive bombers, and I'm going to have them follow me on a very methodical search pattern. Now, he has a little problem. He's running low on gas. And more than a few of his pilots are looking at their gas gauges, wondering if the old man really knows what he's doing. And then McCluskey spots a Japanese destroyer. He figures, that Japanese destroyer is going at high speed towards something. I'll bet you that's the Japanese fleet. McCluskey followed the destroyer. Approaching from the south, he spotted three Japanese carriers. His bombers plunged into their dives, catching two of the carriers by complete surprise. Minutes later, a third U.S. squadron stumbled on the scene and attacked. As McCluskey looked behind, through the tall columns of smoke, he was stunned. The Americans had sunk three carriers, along with some 300 aircraft, and nearly 4,000 men. That man 
And that action took the Japanese Navy essentially out of the war at that moment. The Japanese have gone from an absolute position of supremacy to they never go on the offensive ever again. And it all came down to about th oh, four dozen dive bombers. The pilots who followed McCluskey that day were ordinary men. Many were newly enlisted. They had no right to win, but they did. And in doing so, they changed the course of a war. The Battle of Midway was the most decisive single naval battle in US history. Over the course of World War II, Navy airplanes would provide the dominant firepower in every important battle in the Pacific. Carrier aviation had proved itself beyond measure. watched every World War movie I could get my hands on as a little kid. Yeah. <laughs> Attack on Pearl Harbor, Battle of Midway. The history has shown that even small carrier forces can bring a lot to bear the way things are. One person can change history, basically. So it's a, it's a very large responsibility. What you got there? I nice set of wings. It's a nice finish to a, you know, a lot of hard work. So, yeah, it's definitely, definitely a good time. I let them bask in the glory of it for a day, and I was like, guess what? The next challenge is ahead of you. El Centro, California. Young naval pilots come here to learn how to drop bombs. The first couple flights that you do, it's almost like a head explosion, and there's so much going on. You're learning a dive bombing pattern, which is what they would use in World War II and Korea. You roll 135 degrees inverted, roll out, and start screaming towards the target. You get wrapped up in this, oh my gosh, this thing can go so fast and is so cool to look at, but you're forgetting the reason why they were built and why they exist and why we're trained to fly them. This is the story of a weapon of war, naval aviation. Ever since World War II, aircraft launched from the sea have played an outsized role in America's wars. You are a part of a lineage of people that have been witness to the biggest events of the 20th and now 21st century. But this lineage has been precarious. As warfare evolved, the fortunes of naval aviation seesawed. More than once, it was written off as impractical, too dangerous, or simply obsolete. 
This is a story of repeated challenges in engineering and human moral challenges as well. It won't be easy to think, oh, I'm just going to go out and drop a bomb, and if it kills somebody, it, OK. Map at zero seven two five miles. That took some time and definitely some reflection. And I'm ready. The human in the cockpit. But how long will he or she even be there? Should automation be allowed to replace these pilots? The last fighter pilot's been born. Some might say that. Naval aviation. The machines and the people in them. A hundred year story and an argument without end. In the teens and 20s, only a handful of daredevils and visionaries could imagine that flimsy biplanes and makeshift wooden decks would one day change the nature of war. Hundreds of young aviators risked their lives to bring this technology to the fore. Within 20 years, they'd created a super weapon. In World War II, carriers proved decisive in every major battle in the Pacific. Naval aviation ends World War II at the top of the warfare mountain. They've gone from nowhere to being the biggest and baddest weapon in the world, or so they think. Bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki also destroyed established military doctrine. Soon after, the U.S. created a new independent Air Force and placed it front and center. The Air Force was assigned the mission for uh, delivering atomic bombs. They were the only ones who had the capability, so that was the logical assignment. The Navy could see that if wars of the future were going to be atomic and we, the Navy, didn't have a capability, we were going to be extinct. The Navy staked its future on a massive new carrier, the first since the war, a whole new design. Abruptly, the Secretary of Defense stopped construction. There's no reason for having a Navy, he declared. The Air Force can do anything the Navy can do. This was a blow to the heart, a dagger to the heart of naval aviation. The people who support the big bomb aboard the big bomber run by the Air Force think they've got it knocked. They think they've won the great bureaucratic war. They've, they're, they're going to be the dominant service. And then? There is Korea. On June 25th, 1950, communist North Korea invaded the Republic of Korea to the south. Korea came as a complete surprise to us. The bases that we had planned to use for the Air Force in South Korea were overrun and captured. 
by the North Koreans almost immediately. Just a sliver of land remained in South Korea's control. The U.S. military stared at its options. Now its nearest air bases were hundreds of miles away. And nuclear weapons, what use were they? If North Korea's ally, the Soviet Union, also had the bomb. The situation in Korea is so critical that we in the Navy must give the 8th Army the maximum practical support. I direct that the commander of the 7th Fleet, the commander of Carrier Division 15, be directed to provide the maximum possible air gunfire support. Make it move. In a striking reversal, the military brass dusted off four of its World War II carriers and rushed them to the Korean Peninsula. The carrier was back. The Navy starts building one super carrier per year. Forrestal, Saratoga, Independence, Ranger, Kitty Hawk, Constellation. For the next decade, we add eight more super carriers to the fleet. Korean War, fought mile by mile with conventional weapons, lasted 37 long months. The Navy and Marine Corps lost over 500 planes. I lost 22% of the guys in my squadron when I went to Korea. 22%, you never forget that. You come back from a tour, you've been the commanding officer. There's the single mother, the only thing she had in her life was her son. He was 23 years of age. He was trusted to you, you were to get him ready, take him over there, bring him home. And you didn't. They gotta go visit her, you gotta sit on a park bench, you gotta let her hold your hand. You just gotta sit there and go through it. During Korea, a new aircraft was flying off carriers, the helicopter, ideal for rescue missions. In the winter of 1950, a helicopter would join the effort to save the life of a 24-year-old pilot named Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown had packed a lot into his 24 years. He'd had to, as the first combat aviator to breach the Navy's color line. Jesse grew up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. His father was a sharecropper. He always wanted to be a naval aviator, but he gave up the idea because uh, blacks were not accepted into aviation. He got a scholarship to Ohio State University, and a Navy lieutenant took a liking to Jesse and encouraged him to put in for it, which Jesse did, and he was accepted into the Navy's flight program. He arrives in Pensacola, Florida, which is very much a southern city. The entire Navy establishment, from you know, the officers' club to you know, standing in line for a meal, he was alone. There was no one like him. Yet when he's in the airplane, he generates a certain amount of freedom, only to have to land again and, and face the social inequalities that, that existed as part of America. In 1948, Jesse earned his wings and joined a squadron on the USS Leyte. On the carrier, the atmosphere seemed different. There's a sense of acceptance amongst aviators who share a common goal and a common capability. It was in the tight quarters of the carrier that Jesse Brown got to know fellow aviator Thomas Hudner. Jesse was a very friendly person. 
they joked that he by far got more mail than anybody else on the ship, which was probably true. And he was just uh, the person we all admired and loved. On December 4th, 1950, Hudner and Brown were assigned a reconnaissance mission. By all appearances, routine. It was cold. We had six aircraft in our flight going up for armed reconnaissance. One of the pilots in the flight saw that there was some vapor coming out of Jesse's airplane, and shortly after that, Jesse called out that he was losing oil pressure. He couldn't stay airborne. He was going to have to make a crash landing. He landed with such force that there was no question in the mind of any of us but that he had perished in that crash. We circled around there, and uh, we saw that Jesse had opened the canopy and that he was waving to us. But for some reason, he didn't get out of the airplane. I felt that the chances were reasonably good to pull him out of the cockpit and save his life. So I made the decision to make a crash landing. That's a wheels up landing close enough to him. When I got to Jesse's plane, I could see that the reason he didn't get out was the way the aircraft had buckled it. His knee was caught in there and it just couldn't move. He lapsed in and out of consciousness. I tried to reach in to do something, but uh, there was about two feet of snow on the ground. I couldn't do anything without holding on with one hand and uh, doing my best to keep my balance. When I heard the helicopter, it was like manna from heaven. But when he saw Jesse, his jaw dropped. Between the two of us, we couldn't get a firm footing on anything. Jesse was pinned in so badly that uh, we couldn't move him. Now it was about 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Temperature was about 5 or 10 above zero. And with darkness coming, it was going to get a lot colder a lot faster. The pilot said that he couldn't fly that helicopter in that area after dark. It didn't have instruments. And he said, it was suicide for me to have stayed there. I've always felt bad about the decision, but there was really no choice. I like to think that he was not conscious at that time. When we left Jesse, it was a farewell, really, an unspoken farewell. There's a new magic in the air. It's called jets. And jets change the game for carriers as much as they do for land-based air power, maybe even more. Jets ushered in a futuristic world where man traveled through the stratosphere at twice the speed of sound. But they were not built to land on a deck. The transition to jet aircraft almost killed aircraft carriers. Flying jets in the early days off of carriers was at best difficult and at times near suicidal. The brunt of the transition would be borne by the pilots. It was hairy. We didn't have a lot of experience. I took command of a jet fighter squadron. I had one hour of jet time, one hour in a jet aircraft when I took command of a squadron that was going to deploy. I had people reporting to me 
who had never been in one of those airplanes. They gave me a handbook and said, when you're ready, come down and uh, I'll give you a plane. So I read the book, I got in the plane, I started it, and the guy gave me an up check and I took off. I was a jet pilot. The Navy was slow to recognize the new problems posed by jets. When a propeller plane comes aboard a carrier, the pilot takes away the power, the engine stops turning, so the plane settles on the deck. A jet comes in, and it takes something like 35 seconds for the spindle to unwind. We were going faster. There was no radar. There was not enough room on the carrier. So he hits the deck, and he bounces, and he goes over the barricade. Float over the barriers, land on this pack of aircraft. I've seen seven or eight aircraft on fire. In September of 1951, on the USS Essex, a Banshee twin jet fighter missed its marks and drove into a pack of planes on the forward flight deck. Seven men were killed. Naval aviation during these early days of jets was actually worse in some ways than it was during the golden age of wooden airplanes and iron men in the 20s and 30s. A lot of people died. If pilots couldn't get jets aboard carriers and make them work well, that carrier part of naval aviation was gone. But what looked like impossible problems turned out to have elegant solutions. We see three great things come along which make jets practical on aircraft carriers. The first is the angled deck. The landing section of the deck is slightly canted. All of a sudden, you're not crashing into a deck load of airplanes in front of you. You get another chance. Another thing that they got, the first automated landing system. This is a stabilized system that would provide them an optical landing cue of when they were in the right flight path to come in on that angled deck. And then finally, the British came up with a steam catapult. And by the mid-1950s, we're finally producing our first new aircraft carriers, the four ships of the Forrestal class. By the late 1950s, the fastest, highest flying, most heavily armed, most powerful airplanes in the world are amazingly fighter bombers flying off of aircraft carriers. More than ever, the field was a magnet for the brightest, the cockiest. It was naval aviators in 1959 who crowded into America's new space program. Lift off, and the great white rocket with its human cargo. Astronauts rose. Alan Shepard, John Glenn, Scott Carpenter, Wally Schirra, later Neil Armstrong, they had all learned their craft as test pilots, developing the fighting capacity of jets. In the midst of the Cold War, these planes and their pilots were emblems of American swagger, crisp, modern, and increasingly lethal. We were struggling with the problem of trying to get a nuclear weapons capability. Then we developed the capability with jets. We could take an aircraft that we'd specially designed, put that 2,000 pound package under it, launch it off the carrier, and that weapon had the explosive yield of a million tons of explosive. One million tons. The very nature of carrier aviation, its mobility, would make it for years the most feared element in the nuclear standoff. The important thing was it impressed the Soviets. I don't think we appreciate yet the concern uh, that, the, that the Soviets had about those aircraft carriers. 
The Soviets knew precisely where our nuclear bombers were based. They knew precisely where all of our nuclear weapons in Europe were located. They knew where our intercontinental missiles in the United States were located. But they didn't know where the carrier was. They could be any place. They could be in the Indian Ocean. They could be in the North Atlantic. They could be in the Mediterranean, North Pacific, South Pacific, China Sea, wherever. And the Soviets couldn't keep track of them all. And so that became a threat to them. On the open sea, the Cold War played itself out as a string of cat and mouse games. Deadly serious, but with a touch of the absurd. The Soviets would play a game with you. They would come out and intercept the carrier to test the defenses. We, the pilots, used to like to go up and uh, fly up next to the bare airplane. And they had these big cockpits, and we're in the little, like, little cockpit. So I got up next to this guy, and he looked at me, and I looked at him. And we're probably uh, 100 feet away, maybe, something like that. And the guy gave me the finger, like that. And I gave him the finger back, and, and then I gave him two fingers, and, and we had to, and then he gave me two fingers. And the next thing, we were kind of smiling at each other. And the next thing I knew, the guy, and it was a long ways away, but I could say he held up a, a Playboy, and, and there was a, a centerfold in there. So while the missions were dangerous, on a certain level, on a certain basic human level, uh, sometimes I think, well, we're all kind of the same. Nuclear weapons were folded into the routines of carrier life. Day after day, the men followed their procedures, rehearsed for the unthinkable. Then, on October 21st, 1962, the unthinkable became less remote. I get a call on, on a Sunday about noon Says, get down to your ship, get it underway, and head for the Caribbean. I said, all my sailors are in New York. You know, <laughs> they're up there chasing girls around, which is what they're supposed to be doing, and I hope they're having a good time. I said, no, get underway right now. So we head for the Caribbean. I am carrying 100 nuclear weapons that are to be a backup support for an aircraft carrier that's there that has 100 nuclear weapons. We were pretty serious that we'd make a nuclear weapons attack against Cuba. In the dramatic days that followed, carriers would share the stage with another, less celebrated branch of naval aviation. Reconnaissance is where we have our roots. And in the Cuban Missile Crisis, naval reconnaissance was incredibly important. Routine surveillance had produced strong evidence that the Soviets were building nuclear missile sites in Cuba. If operational, they could strike the United States within minutes. President Kennedy ordered a blockade of the island. But he also fixed his sights on a row of prefab buildings in Jacksonville, Florida, home to a naval unit whose jets were equipped with cameras, uniquely designed for low flight, high-resolution photography. Commander William Ecker received his brief and in the early morning of October 23rd, took off with his wingman. In minutes, they could see Cuba. They make their runs over the missile sites and they see incredible things going on underneath them. People running in every direction, they see the missiles on trailers, they see the launch pads, they see the supporting equipment. You name it, they get pictures of it. As Ecker landed back at the base, a crew was waiting to rush the film to the lab. On October 25th at the UN, Ambassador Adlai Stevenson pressed his Soviet counterpart. Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has 
placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? You will have your answer in due course. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. The Soviet ambassador to the UN denied that they were placing ballistic missiles in Cuba. And here, Hadley Stevenson motions and in come a few people from the CIA with these boards. And Ecker, to his amazement, sees the photos that he and his men have been taking suddenly being presented to the world as the best evidence in the court of world opinion. Just three days after the showdown at the UN, the Soviets agreed to remove the missiles from Cuba. The Cold War equilibrium was restored but it would not hold for long. A lot of bombs were dropped on targets that had already been destroyed many times over. The pilots were getting the heck shot out of them. And every now and then one of them would say, Skipper, what are we doing in this crazy war? It was a real, real uh, time in the wilderness for everyone involved in that conflict, but certainly naval aviation. The Vietnam era, a time of turmoil and discontent, would be one of naval aviation's lowest points. For the pilots, the discontent came early. In 1965, they were tasked with a massive bombing campaign, but with important targets off limits. The bombing campaign in the north was called Rolling Thunder. The pilots referred to it as Rolling Blunder. They really hated it because the White House, in fact, the president himself, would mark up the targets. And we must only approach in this direction because if you come in this direction, you can fly over a, a public school. President Johnson was waging war by proxy against the communists in Vietnam and indirectly the Soviets. He was treading gingerly to avoid a wider war. Haiphong was a port city in, in North Vietnam, and Haiphong had a four-mile circle around it that was a no-fly zone. And I could look down, and what did I see? Ships, Soviet ships, materials being unloaded and unloaded and unloaded. Could we get it? No, the answer is no. Is this the way to fight a war? Well, not when you're on the tip of the fracking spear and the lead's coming up at you. Are you gonna survive or are you not gonna survive? Are you going to survive, or is that guy down there shooting at you going to survive? And, and uh, it's black and white. There's no gray. There's no lawyers. There's no politicians. None of that bullshit. It's he dies or you die. And so you make your decision. And to me, that's war. It's nasty business. It's brutal business. It's why if we're going to go to war, you better get it right to start with. To make matters worse, the tools of war were still crude. It could take dozens of bombs to hit one target. The uh, munitions used in those days were, were not GPS or laser guided. Uh, you're dropping iron bombs at that time. And there was a lot of collateral damage that went along with that kind of uh, low tech that existed back in the Vietnam era. The US would rain down more tonnage on the small nation of Vietnam 
than it had dropped in all of World War II. Back home, many Americans recoiled at what they saw. By the early 70s, anger about the war had merged with other deep-seated resentments. We will define black power. He will listen and recognize it. That's all. That's all. The USS Kitty Hawk set sail for Vietnam in February of 1972. It carried on board all of America's racial divides. Naval aircraft carriers are a microcosm of America. There's a class society that exists on the ship. The captain is the, the king and the ruler, and the officer corps are the directors of things that go on. Enlisted men are that working class individuals, and that's where most of our African Americans existed. You would just end up being a mess cook for a while, or you clean compartments for a while. If you try to get out of mess cooking for over 90 days, or try to quit cleaning toilets, uh, you might have had a long struggle. By October, the crew of the Kitty Hawk had been deployed for over 200 days, working around the clock, eight hours on, four hours off. On October 11th, the workload was lighter, more time for stories to spread about the brawls that had broken out between blacks and whites during a recent shore leave. Midday, sailor Perry Pettis made his way to the deck with two other African Americans. As we three were walking across the flight deck, a couple of Marines approached us and said, you blacks, quote, you blacks can't walk in over twos. We're thinking, yeah, right, kept on walking. Made the comment again, police. I'm gonna have two Marines tell me I can't walk with two other friends. Next thing I know, my neck is under a nightstick with my body up on an A6 aircraft with a nightstick under me. What the heck? When Captain Marlon Townsend learned of the incident, he quickly overruled the Marines and apologized. But it was too late. All hell broke loose. I hate to say it, but it was blacks against whites. It was an all-out riot. People being beat up for no particular reason, just because you happen to be of a different color. That was an ugly night. That was an ugly night. It took 12 hours to end the fighting, and it would prove a turning point in naval history. It shook the, uh, the entire guts of the entire Navy. I don't think the Navy had a choice 
uh, it was long past overdue to make some changes in equality, equal treatment, equal rights, equal access. After Vietnam, the number of blacks in the Navy, both enlisted men and officers, rose steadily. And more change was coming. If there are women who want to go to sea and to serve their country in that capacity, then we can find a way to make it possible for them to do so. Rosemary Mariner was one of the first women to enter Navy pilot training, and years later, to land a jet on a carrier deck. There were some who were adamantly opposed to this, including the head of Naval Air Training. He made it very clear to us that uh, this was not his idea, and others were very supportive. One of the most important figures in my career was my first commanding officer, Captain Ray Lambert, who was one of the, a handful of black men who were naval aviators who had flown tactical aircraft. And when I first reported to the squadron, he uh, sat me down in his office. He says, Rosemary, you're always going to have a tough time because you're short. <laughs> he was a big man. And uh, he uh, said, I used my size to help me establish myself in naval aviation. You're going to have to figure some other way. You cannot outguy the guys. Um, so most women develop their own style. I happen to have attended Catholic girls' schools, and I adopted the Mother Superior style, keeping a straight face most of the time and, and trying to not overreact. Mariner was 40 and a senior officer by the time the law that barred women from combat was repealed in 1993. By the turn of the century, it was no longer unusual to see women pilots in fighter jets. Even though in my day, we had these overt restrictions on us, I often thought that black men were having a more difficult time than women were. It was still rare to see a, a black man get it all the way to the top. Naval aviation is the hardest circle to break into. The majority of African Americans have been in patrol plane or, or helicopter aviation. And so when you go down to the jet training bases, you see very few African Americans. But we need to fix that. The attacks on the World Trade Center on 9-11 would usher in a new and difficult military mission, as much about winning civilian hearts and minds as defeating an enemy. And that mission would be aided by a common tool, GPS, global positioning, which was transforming the craft of naval aviation and the expectations riding on its pilots. After the 9-11 attacks, carriers rushed to the Persian Gulf and have remained a constant presence since. Eric Doyle has flown many missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. I wanted to be a pilot since I knew what flying was. Early on, it was just the pure thrill of flying. And it wasn't until flying the F-18 in training that those realities of actually going to war, dropping bombs on an enemy, started to become a reality. Doyle flew one of the first missions in the Iraq invasion of 2003. His memory of that night offers a window into the recent air wars of the Middle East. We had a pretty good idea that shock and awe was, was about to happen. And then at some point, we did know we were contemplating how many aircraft we thought we would lose, or if we'd lose any, how many would it be folks from our squadron? And it could be me. You take your person out of it. You take yourself and you use 
aircraft and pilot. You don't say me, Eric, or you, Stan. On the second night, me and uh, three other aircraft were going after a missile production facility, carrying multiple uh, GPS guided weapons. So we're pushing into Iraq. We have our target that's, you know, a number of miles out in front of us. And we're seeing all this fire coming our way. It looked like somebody spraying a, a, a water hose. Then we'd also see surface to air missiles being launched and you know, we'd talk about some of them the size of telephone poles. And it's just a very strange, you know, kind of out of body experience. You're so focused on what you're trying to hit that all the philosophical thoughts about what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, why are we here, that's honestly out the window do everything in your power to absolutely have pretty darn close to 100% certainty that bomb is going where it needs to go or that piece of ordnance. And that's where I think we stay, you know, emotionally involved. I dropped four 2,000-pound weapons at once, and all four hit uh, their intended targets. And now the, now the reality that I've been airborne for five hours I need to find my way back to an aircraft carrier and land on it. Now that whole threat starts to seep back in your brain. When you're flying in an airplane at night over the water, it's black, just to the point there are no visual references out there. It's like flying inside a basketball. It's 100% trust, not only to find the ship, but which way is up and which way is down, because it's all unknown. My heart rate was probably as high as it was when I was uh, in country. It's definitely still, regardless of what you're doing, one of the more, if not the most intense things you do, just trying to land that plane. It isn't until after you land back aboard the ship does the adrenaline slowly drain out of your system, and that's when you really start to look back on what happened. And, and I think you go through you know, every emotion you can imagine. It isn't uh, the jumping out of the jet, high-fiving everybody. It's, it, it's sobering. You're the one hitting that button to, you know, send a 2,000-pound bomb into the air. Uh, it's a sobering experience, and it should be. No one knows how many civilians were killed from the air in Iraq and Afghanistan. It is far fewer than in the days of iron bombs, before laser guidance and GPS. Still, each was a human loss, and a propaganda loss, in the struggle to win over hearts and minds. Two thousand eleven marks the tenth year of war in the Middle East, fought village to village, house by house. Once the conflicts shifted to the ground, carrier jets had to get used to a support role, much of it routine. 
You may fly your six to nine hour mission and never really communicate with the soldier level guys. You may never drop a weapon. You may never do anything at all that is really uh, a tangible act in support of them. I'm not gonna lie to you, it'll be, it's a drudgery. After two long, draining ground wars, the costs of naval aviation make it a likely target for cuts. Add in a revolution in technology, and its future seems, once again, wrapped in questions. It's very possible, within a matter of a decade or so, that naval aviators will fly strike missions and never leave the ship. UAV is unmanned aerial vehicle. Basically, it's a model airplane. The Air Force uses them for reconnaissance and strikes, which are controlled five, 6,000 miles away easily from Nevada. Right now, there's a functional limit of about nine to 11 Gs that an airplane could pull. You take the human being out, and the need to keep his fingers, toes, and eyeballs still attached. And suddenly, you can make airplanes that might take 15, 20, 30 Gs. And eventually, we won't have to have a pilot at all. You could have some really good uh, video gamer who's uh, 18, 19 years old uh, at the controls. My recent experience in Afghanistan, there's unmanned uh, UAVs out there flying around with us in the same area. And it always kind of seemed like something that, ah, that'll eventually be there. It's something from the movies. And then actually talking to the operators hundreds, if not thousands of miles away is interesting. It's. Uh, Surreal may be a better word. An experienced combat aviator is going to think twice before he or she pulls the trigger. And there is that possibility that when you remove the human from being on position over the target area, that decision to squeeze the trigger and release ordnance, you divorce yourself and your, your feelings away from what happens in combat. Kingsville, Texas, the Naval Training Center where a new generation of pilots is being prepared for combat. They seem prepared also for the revolution coming their way. You can't hide the fact that unmanned aerial vehicles are definitely the future. Uh, the capabilities, the, the ability for them to stay, you know, aloft for hours and hours, uh, they have better eyes than we do. They have longer legs. They, they don't have a bladder. If you take the emotion out of it, they're going to make, as a military, us a lot stronger. I think we're close. I think it's, uh, we've got the coolest plans we can make, and after this, it's going to be uh, the robots and nobody else. There's a sense that, you know, they're making the last cowboys here kind of kind of feeling. And, and maybe we'll get to tell our grandkids that, you know, we went ripping around the sky back in the day in fighters, and that was, that was a lot of fun. I think it's a great chapter in American history, but man flight might be coming towards, towards its end. I'm generally an optimist when it comes to naval aviation. Basing options for the United States are in decline worldwide, and the ability to operate from the sea is a capability that we're gonna need more of, not less. But if you're one of those young men and women who is getting ready to go into the Navy or the Marine Corps and wants those wings of gold, do you really want this job? Is it gonna go away on you in the middle of your career? 
There has been jokes in the past, you know, hey, the last fighter pilot's been born. But the threat is always going to drive the show, and, and there is going to be a demand. You can't do everything with a robot or a computer. Here's Lieutenant Bishop, front and center. The pilot is held accountable for a decision that's made on scene. It's difficult to imagine when we can get to a point where we can hold a computer, a piece of software, accountable for a life and death decision. We are moral beings, and at least machines at this point in time are not. That's what I would miss the most if airplanes went the way of drones, that there the opportunity for that kind of personal excellence and that sense of human excellence as expressed in controlling the technology in a moral sense will, will be lost. We're a part of a pretty rich history and you guys are part of that and you're gonna, you're gonna make history. I ask you to embrace that, feel proud of it and uh, do us proud. It's a hundred years since a foolhardy pilot set out to land a plane mid-ocean on an improvised wooden deck. The pilots with the gold wings inherit a history that's turbulent. Excellent. One, two, and three. And if the years ahead are the same, that can hardly come as a surprise.